Hello and welcome back to season three of the Let's Face It podcast. This is my journey with them. We're very, very lucky and fortunate to be joined today by Jamie Conlon, brother of our friend Michael, and they've been huge supporters of Let's Face It from from the very start. And with some big, uh, with a big, big, big event coming up in, in three weeks, two, two, three weeks, two, three, three weeks then. Three. Three weeks this weekend. Yeah? Three weeks. Um, in the Odyssey, where hopefully Michael's going to become world champion. But I suppose behind every great man, after uh, a great woman, there's a there's a great manager, uh, which we'll get into in a bit. But again, a huge thanks to Use Cars and I for sponsoring this whole season. Um, the Anthony and all the team that supports greatly appreciate it. Wouldn't be possible without having uh, sponsors and uh, no, it's great. So thanks very much to Use Cars NI. Hit them up on www.usecarsni.com. Um, it's a great place, a great platform. If you want to sell your car, you can log in, just upload the wee photos, just and then put in your age and everything will look after itself after that. And on the other side, of it, if you're looking to buy a car, any all sorts of makes, models, all that crack from all around the country. Uh, so go to use cars NI for all your car needs and uh, yeah thanks again for all your support but Jimmy what's a crack? How are you? Well, you always say not that even if you're, uh, just, if you're up to your eyeballs like, but yes all good. It's up to your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's so funny and then when you walk past someone on the street you're like well how are you and all, very often everyone well, I dead on make yourself I dead on and then you just yeah. walk on again without actually being like I suppose that's why I have this podcast to try and create that space to be like, how are you? But how are you really? Are you? <laughs> but like, I suppose like any other guest, Jimmy, like you've had a, you come on there, you sit down, you said, oh, I don't know what to talk about. My life's been boring. Whereas from the outside looking in, I'm like, fuck, your life's been so interesting, and so fascinating. But the whole idea, I do it with all the podcasts, uh, all the guests that come on the podcast. We have, we've had some very, very interesting chats, and we've had a few of, uh, we've had obviously Mick on, with Body McCrory on, but you know. People who are uh, under common boxing, like, um, mm. and they've discussed their journeys, and I suppose you've had your own journey mm. through boxing. Um, but we always start off with, I suppose, who you are and who you came from and where you came from, and a wee bit about your childhood growing up and what that was like for you. Like, well, I'm the oldest of four brothers, um, and the smallest probably as well, which was always a bad thing. But uh, we grew up Camney Street. I thought it was, I was just speaking to, uh, picking up the, my, one of my daughters from school today and I was talking to another parent and when I live out in Lisburn and you, you I was saying I'm from West Belfast and he was also from West Belfast growing up and I said it's the perfect childhood. Yeah. From what I, what I, mm-hmm. you know, my memory of it, and we're talking about how you were just going out at a Saturday, Sunday or summer, nine o'clock in the morning, you wouldn't come back till later on at night and whereas now it's a bit more of the helicopter parenting, people watching where their kids mm-hmm. are constantly and you're a bit more aware and afraid and stuff like that and I'm getting off track here but we were talking about our own kids and where do you go now, no, how do you kind of prepare them for the real world, mm-hmm. how do you protect them from the real world, where is the kind of balance but we were four kids, Cabney Street, I loved every minute of it, some crazy times, some some mad things, but they all shaped you. We, I, I, we spoke earlier. I truly believe, like we are products of our environment, and my environment was a very loving environment. Mum and Dad were brilliant. They still are. They're very supportive of everything we've done. My dad is the Irish Olympic coach, and my mum was a teacher in Belfast Met. But they were always kind of very like like loving parents mm-hmm. and. Yeah, that's kind of shaped all four of us growing up. We were, we were always kind of the same. I wouldn't say we we're troublemakers or anything. They make a little bit more than any of the others. But that was the, that was the hardest thing about growing up as the oldest, is, uh, especially all boys. Someone had a problem, you had to go and take yes. liquor and look after it. go, fuck me. That's a bigger. I remember one day, a friend of mine, Paul McKinney, Peter Davids, um, he, Michael used to th- make a thing with the last. He went to Corpus and I went to La Salle, and he used to wait with my other cousin and throw stones at all the people going to other schools. <laughs> so McKinney and stuff would have been walking, and he used to be throwing stones. And he's a big guy, McKinney. I remember playing for, uh, football after school or something, and I just remember the shadow standing above me saying, like, If your brother hits me with a stone or calls me names again, I'm going to knock your body. So I'm like, What? <laughs> 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 Die. 
But anyway, that's, that was us. Like, <laughs> and the thing was, though, there was plenty of times when someone got in trouble, you all had to go. And uh, I, was, I, mean, I always made sure like, if, it was, if one of you are fighting, everyone is fighting, and it has to be that way. One goes the way we all go to We all, aye, we always did. Aye. But there was troubles were few and far between. Mm. I think I was pretty quiet enough growing up. No, that's class. And I think you can touch there a wee bit, and we do. We talk about it all the time, about products, environments, and stuff like that. And, how you're moulded and how you're brought up and I suppose you're at the other end of it now, you just touched on it like your daddy and mm -hmm. you're probably a lot of them values you got from your mum and dad, mm -hmm. you're now putting them into your kids, yeah. you know, um, but even like on the other side of it too, like growing up in Cavendish Street in West Belfast, you know, obviously it's probably, it's probably a bit worse now, Jimmy, than, I don't know, you know, in terms of like distractions and like you walk down the street there, like, and drugs and yeah. different things like that, and it's just so, so scary and so, so accessible. Um, and I think with, like, social media and people, like, constantly comparing themselves to other people, maybe not feeling good enough, like, you maybe didn't have that, as you said there, you're up, you're out at 9 o'clock in the morning, you're playing football, I don't know, you're maybe doing the back gardens and having a bit of crack and wrap the doors run away and all, all them things that, like, it's innocence of, like, laughter and stuff like that, but now that there's so much, people are so indulged in this thing called mo like mobile phones and the internet and they're constantly comparing and not feeling good enough and like what can you see much of a difference between your childhood than what you can actually see now within your kids what they're being exposed to growing up like i think it's it's night and day like what we grew up with uh, you you kind of can see it you can feel uh, it you can touch it now you can't mm. you know now everything is digital social as you said you look on your phone um I was listening to someone talking the other week and they were saying about like, bullying in schools and it's not just when schools, it's like when they come home from school, how do you know your kid isn't mm. getting bullied online? It's this online world, this fake world that that we're all so kind of in now mm. and we value more than real social interaction. That's kind of like, like it's scary compared to what we were growing up. You think, well at the minute my kids are all small mm. and what I'd say, like, my missus constantly is always complaining about the house being being a mess and different wee things and I keep saying to her is like small kids small problems big kids big problems with the big kids is is this digital social fucking cesspit of a world I despise it I, I hate social media I just I can never kind of adapt to it I see things and especially with Mick um, Mick being right. very controversial on, on different elements not necessarily controversial he, he put his yeah, strong belief. from us, strong yeah. belief from what he kind of wanted to be and wanted to set out and people kind of, his opinion on what he wants to do and who he is and um, you know, it, that, that offends others yeah. so he gets a lot of negativity and a lot of flack and it always kind of, like I see it and it's going like that, I, never the real names and stuff like that, that that will never happen in real life mm -hmm. and that is the difference but now and I think what's with kids growing up you see, you probably see a change in 10 years time and her our kids are, and you know, they respect the others, elders, whoever else, because there is no repercussions for their actions. You can say something to anyone you want, like you can be as vile as you want it to be, and there'll be no repercussion to it. He'll put his phone down and walk away and eat his dinner and think, ha ha ha. You know, whereas if he said that to you in the street, you'll chin him. Yeah. You hit him a slap, you grab him by the ear, you bring this man down, you'll probably chin his dad. So, so things like that kind of. It is what uh, I'm, I'm wary of in the future, like mm -hmm. with my own kids. Like growing up, <laughs> the, like you got into trouble, everyone got into trouble, but again, you, you, you understood that <laughs> your man and dad the other day, <laughs> someone's going to get the face image. Right, the face image. Yeah. Whereas now, nah, I don't know, they can create a fake profile mm -hmm. and you can call yourself what you want and how the fuck do you find them and, and mm -hmm. then they say all they want to you or whatever. So. Scary, isn't Scurry, it? the thought of what, what, what's coming. Uh, I, and even the, regarding like, even the social media side, and even Mick, well, we'll get into that in a wee bit down the line whenever we're going to sort of you managing and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But even in terms of like boxing for you, and we talk like obviously where we're from, like being involved in sports yeah. and being involved in that sort of community within sports, like me being involved in the GAA is like a family in itself. And I suppose you and the boxing club. You only holy family? No, I was in St John Bosco. You were since I had Aidan Wilson last week. He was. He was holy really family. Uh, He's a few monks down. Uh, 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 um, but you know, how how much of a role did, did, did 
boxing play in your sort of teenage years and what, how did you get into boxing and what was the crack there? We touched on like drugs and society and drinking and society. Well, when we were younger, drugs was, I don't think, mm. it wasn't as prominent, well it isn't, it wasn't as, nowhere near as prominent now. And the area was a lot different back then as well, you know, we were in different times and drugs wasn't on the street, whereas now it's so accessible to anyone. And I've been lucky enough, like, boxing separated us away from drink, you know, you were training on a Friday night, mm. So you finish training and you come back and everyone had had a wee drink and stuff like that and you've missed it all. Mm. And at that time probably I was always fighting with my dad about stuff like this, saying like I'm missing out on mm. my childhood and stuff. Uh -huh. And whereas now I'm going like I was blessed. You know, we didn't really drink. I still don't really drink and it's never kind of it's never been a big part of me. Like but but it avoided it from us all. Lucky enough again as we spoke about part of our environment, mates. Everyone loves sport. Mm -hmm. When the Olympics is on every four years, we were flying around the, the block on, on bikes or running around the block, no racing each other. If tennis was on, you'd catch fucking yeah. tennis rackets and you'd waggle up against the wall if you're playing Wimbledon. And then boxing and GAA, everything else. We always kind of found a home in sport, and that's kind of what, you know, all day, every day was some kind of sport, whatever it was, you'd done it. And, and that kind of I was always ingrained in us from a very young age, especially mm -hmm. from the day. Every sport we done. And, and I always remember I wasn't really great at football and I thought I was a lot better than I was and I was with Sully Boys for a few years and went to my and my dad used to come he, I don't think he could have been ours but he was at everything we'd done yeah. like he drove drove us drove the team bus for a while as well you know we went to GA play for the Crowleys before at the span mm. and the Crowleys and Clannard and um Next door, sure he is, to <laughs> <laughs> next door neighbor used to bring us up for that and he used to come to that but late, long enough and a father figure who was there, who mm -hmm. supported everything that we'd done. And we'd done everything. So much so, like, when, we, when I started boxing, he made sure that, and it wasn't, I, so I wore someone else's boots. I didn't wear any boots for mm -hmm. the first year. Then for the second year or the third year, someone gave me a pair of boots, like their old hand-me-downs. Because he went, because I bought, when, I, when we played football, I got the R9 boots. Mm -hmm. I got the best of that. There. When we'd done something else, GAA, I got the micro helmet mm -hmm. and it's thrown away. Mm -hmm. And we'd done everything else. Everything just went to ship. But boxing kind of was different. I think it was like, um, it was his last kind of thing for us to say, this is what I want you to like, get into. He made, I, I didn't really want to go. Brenton, my friend between, I, between me, and, me and Michael, he was the one who wanted the box. Um... He was kind of always kind of pushing for it, and you know, he went. I had to go with him. Because you're the big brother. <laughs> Whereas at NM Nick was chatting the bit to come yeah. with us. So yeah, my my thing, and always remember is that he had said, and my dad said to me, like, I'll give you fifty pound if you go three nights a week for a year. Don't miss a full year if you do this and stick this. So I never got the fifty pound, <laughs> but I ended up falling in love with boxing. Like, and yeah. that was kind of how it was. And again, look, it just. It's just, I think, a lot of luck and different things. And again, the people around you who can direct you and put you into things. And he, he, I mean, that was always very forceful on that first year that we stuck it out, just done it. And we were always learning how to defend ourselves. That's what he wanted, is just to make sure we mm. knew how to look after ourselves. Mm. At the end of that year, Michael was coming. He was too young. He couldn't, he wasn't about to join. And he just wanted to kind of go, go, go. And, he went up to the local club in Clannard and that's, he, he went a different route like, to me and Brenton and then came in a few years later. It's mad, isn't it? Uh -huh. it's class, it's so fascinating. And then in terms of like fighting there, we're going to that a wee bit, not on the streets, but <laughs> in the ring, like you mentioned there a lot of, not, not just, you know, not all about maybe getting into the ring and winning and stuff like that, but as you said, there that sort of resilience, not being able to stand your two own two feet, and it's mm -hmm. a it's a good way, I suppose, to be brought up, you know, to be able to defend yourself. And we're not talking about, you know, going about the streets and knocking the head of people. Because I've, I've had enough boxers on the podcast to feel like I'm close to Eddie Hearn now, my knowledge. No, and I don't usually dress like this. Was <laughs> but and I was wearing a pair of shorts last week, like, but uh, but like. It's it's more of a not like a, a, a building that resilience and building that confidence and building them sort of life skills that you can take into school, you can take into maybe down the line job interviews and things like that. And that's that's the, the value that I see sport having on people. Yeah. Like what happens in our on a match on a Sunday afternoon as you get further on obviously it becomes more and more important. But the them early days it's it's kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to Paddy Barnes, he was on the podcast, he beat his first nine fights. Yeah. Like 
you know, and I'm going to myself, and then you became an Olympian. But very often in today's world, when it's like, when I'm not good at something, as in a child, it's like, oh, I'm away, I'm not doing this anymore. You know what I mean? If I'm not like fucking Ronaldo and soccer, right, I'll do something else. Like, but there was probably something within your dad being like, right, you probably need a year at this. Mm-hmm. To build the skill, to build whatever. It is. Listen, I'm no expert, but and you'll reap rewards down the line. Like, but it's mm-hmm. them core things that you're building. Firstly, you know that resilience, as I said, that being able to defend yourself, that sort of people skills, that going into the gym and you know just being a good person mm-hmm. morally too. Um, at what stage then did you think that you know? Hold on, I can actually have a go at this. Or I never did. Right? I, I, I never did. Or I never did. Ever? Ever. Well, till, till I, like, even as a pro, I was no. still kind of winging it, to, really? to an extent. Um, what was your amateur career like? I won the Irish titles uh, right through, since I was young. I represented Ireland all over the world. I was due then to go to the Commonwealth Games. You won um, the Commonwealth Games? No, I was due to go. No. So, uh, we we were kind of, I, I, I was number one in the country for mm. the past few years. Number one in Ulster. Uh, Commonwealth Games is upcoming. Um, Michael then had just turned 17, so he was oh, sorry, he was still 16 when the, the, the also Championships started, and uh, both of us had entered the same weight, so my, my dad and Shawnee kind of said, we'll, we'll put Michael in. At that stage, like, like, I had seen it since he was fucking 12. Like that. Oh really? Before that even. He was doing things at 8 or 9, but that me and other lads who were 15, 16 or whatever weren't able to do, and you're mm. going like... Yeah, he's a bit different, very, very, and so I was always very hard on it, like always kind of, I would have spotted him from a young age, made sure he kind of felt like he wasn't the boss or anything yeah. like that, and kind of hang him, till he, got, oh, till he got to a certain thing, and then just every spar we had, we had to stop sparring later on, like, but we, it would turn into a proper fight, like real test of everything, resolved now, because he was able to, to match it, like I'm an older brother, so my ego was in check constantly, mm-hmm. when my younger brother was starting to beat me up. I'm starting to go like fuck me, but then again, pride had took over because I'm going like he's he's better. I worked in Bombardier before I turned. So like back to the thing, come off games. I was on the fourth Ulster Championship, I think, or five five in a row, nearly. At, at a, a close final the year before, he was at Rory Dalton from St James's mm-hmm. had beat Rory, and, and there was another kid, another few kids. And I was sure we're all in it. We entered Michael and we didn't enter Michael. And say, make not do anything, but it's next year, it's about building them for next year. We're the same weight. We got drawn on the different ends of the draw, and, and we kind of start working up. Semi final night, I'm on the. I was the night before him, I had a, a, a destroyed that guy, but he was fighting Roy Dalton, and everyone, including myself, was saying, I don't know if he's going to win. Like, so I'll hit him, but he was unbelievable, and that was kind of his christening, and, and we got both got to the final. And um, at that stage, we were training in John Breen's gym at night time. And, like, we were, it was all set out the very start. If, if both get to the final, I'll 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 go on and go to come off games, and then that's it. I just knew then. I just said to my dad, "Listen, I'm gonna go pro probably bring this set." So I was gonna retire. Actually. I was gonna pack it in. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm, "I'm done. I'm working on Bombardier." Um, like, mix the future. He's the one who should who should take it. He'll 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 do better than me. And it, like no one had thought about that at the start. No one had never been the set. How old are you? Whatever you said this. Twenty one, twenty one, twenty two, twenty one. Um, and Michael was sixteen, just turned seventeen. And he, um, we sat down. We all kind of figured out what was the right move, and like, we said, "Yeah, that's the right move." Man. He went in. I went down and met John Brain, and still was kind of. I'd fell my love of boxing around about that time. Just. Just doing it for the sake of doing it. Trips were good. Mm. You were going around messing. I, like I wasn't giving it the full what I should have been giving it. Um, but I knew Mick was, he was the one going to do something different. Like I, when I went to the international level, I would have got to a certain stage mm. and then them Europeans and all but like Eastern Europeans, Russians, U- Ukrainians, they could figure out my style pretty quickly, but they could never figure out his style. And I kind of could see it. Like he, 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 at a young age, like, Megan never got exposed in terms right. of like the big Irish trips or anything like that, where I was on every trip from I was like 14, 15, went around the world. He got, he got, he came through at the right time. And that was kind of, that was it. I'm doing my John Breen, signed a pro contract on the night of the finals, and, and handed over the, the title to Megan in the Ulster Hall that night. 
That's powerful, mm-hmm. isn't it? Like, and that's why I asked you how old you were because as a twenty or twenty-one year old, you touched on it. Your ego, all these different things. As a big brother, you know. Listen, we all have an ego. We've t- I've talked about this with Mick yeah. too. Like, we all kind of need to have a bit of an ego to push on and do well. And but there's a difference between having a strong enough ego and being really happy and uh-huh. you know being a wee bit too much. But for you, twenty-one years of age to have even the maturity and the vision for your younger brother mm. to be like, you know what, I actually see a future for him and what he's doing here. I'll happily take a step back to help yeah. him flourish. Is incredible, isn't it? Mm. Uh, where, where, where do you think that came from? You? I, you're the oldest brother. You have to look yeah. after all the rest. You, you, you felt that responsibility. I had to, I had to look, make sure he was, he was, he was in front. Like, but I, he, I, I can't describe right, okay. how, how good he was so, compared so to everyone else. Yeah. Like, it did, no one really noticed it, and mm. like when I was working, on it, I just kept telling everyone, like, I have a younger brother. He's, and people would come up to me even now, like when they ask mm. me, Are you the boxer? I said, it's not me. The other mm-hmm. brother is, is the boxer. I don't like to be kind of hang there. I just always shy away from it. But he was always like, he was always destined for for the top. Like. Yeah, and he's going to be there in a few weeks now, hopefully. But you go into Dan Brings Gym, you're saying that professional contract, you know, 18 fights, professional fights, is that right? That I 20, 20. 20. Yeah, I'm uh, totally right. You know, you want to get beat once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> from the outside looking in, again, no expert I ever go, Jesus, that's unbelievable. Um, what was that sort of experience like through the pros? Or did did you enjoy? It? I, I'm getting the sense off you here, Jimmy. You didn't really enjoy boxing that much. No, I did. I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed elements of it, uh, but it it was a long, hard slog, uh, especially as a pro. Um, being like I was a flyweight, super flyweight, so there wasn't much opportunities, and right. I always knew at the very start. So I worked even as a like I was ranked number three in the world, and I was still working like with with our Brenton flagging and doing different things like right. that. Though. Until a certain point in my career where I was making a wee bit of money and then I just knew, right, okay, I can I can make as much money as I can. It was about a three, four year span mm. and then get out. And that's kind of what always my end goal was. It was never really to... If I All I wanted was a chance to see if I could be world champion. And mm. If I wasn't going to win the world title, then what the fuck am I doing it for? Because like, my ego isn't in boxing. I don't care mm-hmm. about being the boxer. I get now being in the position and rolling them in fighters coming to that end of the, their career where you have a reputation mm-hmm. and you know, your name, the label that has the boxer, losing that tag is a big culture shock, like mad correct, like change of trajectory in your life. Yeah, for, for even uh, endorsements and opportunities. And everyone, like, yeah, like, yeah. like you're probably first and foremost known as playing for, like, uh, GA, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. earning everything, like what you're doing. Yeah. So, once you lose that, like, like and, le- and if you don't have a pathway to go into something else, mm-hmm. You're lost. Hundred percent. And and whereas I was kind of, oh man, I, I would win a fight and I wouldn't, wouldn't go out, wouldn't celebrate. I would wait about a week or two till yeah. it all died down. I need hoopla about it and go out with mates. That's amazing. Uh, and that's something that I'm trying to like. I've sort of got there now. Um, I often say I was even talking this morning. <coughs> I was up in a, in a doing a wee corporate thing and I was saying about like not letting, you know. A result of X, Y, or Z ruin my happiness. Mm-hmm. So I've always filling up my own cup. And what does that look like? So we play. We have a match here, which would have been today, mm-hmm. Sunday. Like so, the result of that match is not going to dictate how I feel on a Monday. Okay, you can maybe be down about it or whatever, but I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to like. I'm going to get on with my week and mm-hmm. do what's right for me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and I can sense you were at that you know yeah. level years ago, like being like, do you know what? Okay, I, I go on a fight, but it's not who it's not going to defend me. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be definitive. Yeah. And I think that <clears throat> I talk loads, even and all across all sports, Jamie. Like you get people who are so fixated in being the best, like as in like the world champion, like the best, the one percent. Say mm-hmm. <clears throat> as a result of what? Do you know what I mean? So if I'm putting everything into, even say hurling, like you know, I could be putting probably under ten, twenty percent in the. But what about? Me then looking after me and my headspace. I need to have a better balance in my life, otherwise it'll fucking turn to, you know. Then if I don't make the team, if I don't win a match, then it'll be like fuck me. The whole world's end again. So having that sort of balance, and you often see it with people who retire. You're talking about like backup plans or career opportunities. People who retire often then go down the route of addiction, yeah. gambling, yeah. drink, drugs, trying to get that high that, uh, off 
the hard one for the rear boxing and the only way I can describe that is not getting too highs with the highs or too lows with the lows and yeah. just trying to stay at it and even but and that's just so powerful that you even had that sort of awareness then whether you even meant to have it or not it was it's kind of it's very it's refreshing do you yeah. know it, it is very very refreshing but like and I wanted to read this out there because you, you mentioned there a couple of things about like at 21 years of age there Jimmy you um you said that you made that choice ultimately to be like fuck I, I can see a future here yeah for, for my brother mm-hmm. um which is was just incredible that gave me actually goosebumps but this is what he had to say about you okay um jamie's the reason i am where i am now as a professional but he's also the reason why i'm still boxing i looked up to him my whole life and i still do if he had of quit whenever when he was 18 i would have finished um, when I was a kid, all I wanted to be was just like him. He's been a fantastic role model for me and the rest of my brother, brothers, all of our lives. Okay. How does that make you feel? Alright. He wasn't saying that the other day when he said he was <laughs> shit and <it's> smart. <laughs> um, no, uh, it, like it shows I've done something right then. Mm-hmm. But, uh, no, I was the oldest brother. I looked up to make more and I looked mm. up to anyone and like I think it comes across that I could see things that other people couldn't but I could also see the mistakes other people couldn't and, and that's what he was making but no there was and there was a lot of kind of times that were tough like between both of us and Fred because I would say I was more well I was I would be as same as my dad as both like two fucking father figures going mm. on sometimes and the difference is I know when they kind of take it away and go, right, nice time to be a brother. Mm-hmm. Nice time to put an arm out and help him a wee bit or anything like that there. So it's nice. It's yeah. nice to hear it though. It is nice because very often we are just an autopilot and we're just like boom, boom, boom. I wouldn't stuff say, he wouldn't say nothing to me. I wouldn't say nothing to him. You know, I would say to you. Ah. Like I wouldn't say to him. Yeah. Like, what, what 100%. Like, what <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? It's so, even with me and our public, like, I can relate that so much. I yeah. know, like, I'd be proud of him, like, of how far he's came and what he's doing now. He's getting married now next yeah. year. But I'd never go up and be like, public. Uh, <laughs> you're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> but I know for a fact he's even maybe saying that to yeah. some of his mates yeah. or whatever that yeah. I'm sort of yeah. doing alright again. And it's, it's cool, though, yeah. to maybe hear that. And it's so warming. And it's important sometimes we need to maybe stop and just do that a wee bit more often because. You know, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and sometimes we need a wee, as you say, we arm around the shoulder and being told, you're doing alright. Like, mm. um, but, you know, we're not going off one there a wee bit, but it was, it's important too, like, and it's nice, and it, it is very warm, and that there, like, I, I didn't know if I would be able to read that without choking, because like, oh, it, it, oh, it did, it, it, it touched me, like, it's, it's really nice. But, you know, what age then, we, what, what made you then... Was it after the defeat in the in the? What it was, in my head, it was before. Right, I, okay. I was I was I was kind of done. We, I had three, four, three. My last f- four or five fights were all kind of fate of the year. Mm-hmm. One was two or two were fate of the year, four to fate of the year, like, internationally British fate of the year as well. Um, so I knew the fates were getting fucking tough. Mm-hmm. The problem with me was I was drained on the weight, like I was getting carried down. Okay. The st- so on the day of the weigh-in. For my final fight, I remember getting carried down the stairs by, by my missus and my dad out of the bath down. The drain that lasts like two or three pound off and I was like, just like, just get me the fucking, just get me this way in, like get me away in. And I remember just feeling like completely, sh- complete shit. And then we got to the way in, I looked over and I seen Polly Barnes and says, I fainted. And I went, I feel fucking great now. Just seen him come down, I went, I feel great. <laughs> He's like, oh, I feel like I want to faint or something. As soon as I heard someone else is in struggle or bang, I was like, no, I'm alright, I'm alright. <laughs> but it was a killer. No, and I had known for a while. We were so, was, there was a I mean, fucking two years on and off mm-hmm. where we were going to be fighting for a world title, and you were kind of just keep there. You were in touch and distance. I was number three in the world for at least three or four years. I'd moved up. I'd fought another guy and kind of moved up and. And the world champion was he is he was like he was was then the world champion and he still is like the, one of the pound for pound one of the best. The guy called uh, Inui mm-hmm. from Japan, like he is unbelievable, and he's like three or four weeks heavier now. Fucking unreal. And um, 
I was waiting for him to move up. He was always waiting to move up. So I'm waiting for him to fucking move up to fight this, to fight the number one. Now I'm number two at this stage, and he was just taking forever. Me and Mickey were in Australia. Mickey was fighting Australia, and, and the world champion Jaron and Kaz was on that card, and he was training the same time as Michael Filipino guy. And I was friend. He's in my weight. He was like the IBF chairman. I was the WBO number one or two, and um, I'd say the Mick number one. I hope I never fight that guy. Yes, I just hope I never fight that guy. <laughs> He's just so good. <laughs> and then, thing I, like, we finished Australia. Um, me and Paddy were about to start, uh, start training. I got a call to say, German and Cass, keep, we've got a fight with German and Cass, and we've got it in Belfast. Ah, uh, fuck right. Oh, all right, no problem. And it's like, again, your ego. And the boxer, probably yeah. the same as, yeah. uh, most sports probably the same yeah. as GAA. I backed myself. Mm -hmm. So I watched him and said, ah, fuck, I can beat him, you know. Like, when no, it's I'm, the worst Belfast thing. Oh, I, I, I can beat him. The more I watch him, I'm like, fuck, I can beat him. I can, I can beat him, no problem. I can beat him. I can, beat him. I, can, I, can, I can make this tough. I can beat him. I can bring it later. I can beat him. And like, Jamie fucking three months before was going, would have said, <laughs> you don't have a fucking chance. But um, in the hang, and then like, uh, we, we were, I'd known before, me and my, me and my missus had bought a house. We'd moved. We, well, we bought our first house, me and Michael, and, and now Mrs. All bought our first house. Mick was on the Irish team, so he wasn't there Tuesday to Friday. He would come home, dump his wife on the weekend, and go back. And it was in Dunville Street. And then we moved, We he moved and bought his house with Shauna, and we say Paddy Barnes up the second thing, weren't we? And then me and Tracy moved out to Lisburn. And we bought our house. And I, I kind of bought my house. I'd saved up from 2014, 2014, 2015. My 14, saved all the kind of money, said, if I lead this game of a house, mm -hmm. then I can figure out whatever the fucking landscape is like after. I'm, like, if I have to, I want to, if I had to do everything, go back to the thing, learn something new, I can do it, I can figure it out. But if I can have a house, and she didn't want me to kind of retire that stage, but then she got pregnant, and I'd known she was, she was pregnant, we were in training, and then just like, was getting close, and I was like, mm -hmm. I, I'm away, when I'm, when I'm training, I'm very... Uh, I would say selfish to an extent, do I? You need, yeah, you need to be I went no, away. No. Um, I didn't speak to much people. I would have went in my room, the like, trained room, mm -hmm. read, sleep, Netflix, Repeat. back train, room, eat, whatever. Like I would never have socialized. Like Paddy was a fucking social yeah. butterfly when he came out. So he came over and he he trained with me and Danny Vaughan. And when he came over, he was like, like he was just floating around. Yeah. Everything, everything for me was so serious, man. Yeah. So fucking high intense. So, like when as I'm saying, when I fought, I would have closed the fucking blinds for, and just like I didn't want to see anyone. I wanted mm. to completely like just get away from it all. Mm. Didn't want to think about boxing. Didn't want to think about anything because I would be so, when I'm in there, it's like so one track mind. Yeah. Everything has to be right. Everything has to be very, very. Um, I would have been rude. People, not not in a way to like mm. hang it, just with it. If you're not going to benefit me, you make it in my mm. way, can I? And just oh, I don't want to give you my time. So when kind of coming to that stage, we were training in Glasgow, and I was just fucking. It, it took a lot out of me doing all them camps, and I just knew before that fight, I'd say to Tracy, like, if I win, win a world title, much in return, 20 and all world champion, mm. that's what I want to do. I, I want to retire that. And she says, well, what have you lose? And says, if I'm going to lose, then well, we've got a house, we've got someone in the bank, we've got a car, we'll figure the rest out. And, and kind of, when I lost, I knew when I got back in the changing room, I knew on the way back, I was fucking devastated, but I knew on the way back, I knew, I'm done, man. Mm. And I sat in the changing room, and, and I knew, and it was a close group around, and uh, seeing people's attitudes, and, and when you lose, everyone's different, mm. and how they kind of, how things are, but... Um, I knew I was I was done. I got offered a, a, another fight. I got offered fifty grand for a comeback fight, and um, with the same card as Michael in Michael's first fight back in the Odyssey, I was getting fifty grand. I think it was, and I said, "I've no love for it. It would be, I wouldn't be able to give. I can't give any more to it. I would give a lot to them fights. Like fights would have been up and down. They could have been yo-yo and knocked down, up and knocked down, up, and it took a lot out of me. So." I, I, I couldn't put a price on it. Oh, I couldn't put a price on it. Mm -hmm. Couldn't pay me enough to kind of get mm -hmm. back in. I, I, I loved when I done it. I loved it. That's why now, like I've never, 
they cut back in ne like never now have like as they say itchy knuckles or never want when never I never sparred or never sparred no since you left that night no no since I left that night no I, I have gym in the house and I hit the bags and stuff mm. like that but you know there's no never no desire no desire of thing and I know what the I know what boxing does to people like I know the trauma puts on there I know what the stress puts on their head I know the damage it causes on mm. on the mind like the, like nights I've had were fucking tough like there's like fights I would have had a black and blue from my knuckle thing I you can't even wipe your arse in the morning like, yeah. like, yeah. every night uh, Tracy I have a recording of every after every fight I'm probably per show, no, sure it one day um, after like say 2014 I wrote like four fights in a row really really tough where it was cut swollen and everything and after every fight I would have just got a bath everyone's out partying I would have got a yeah. fucking ba hot bath and just would have laid in a fucking bath for about an hour because I'm just my ba battered mm. like that's every part of me yeah. and it's probably the best thing about boxing is it's the true reflection of a person mm. it's you naked to the world mm -hmm. and you're going to identify yourself and be yourself mm -hmm. you're either going to be my problem always was I was just all balls mm. everything I learned in camp was out the window I just went in for a fight mm. mix more but like Tron very much like Tron so I know what Throne is going through and his fates after his fates and what takes out of him. He's more of a social butterfly than I yeah. am and, and, and he's more out there and he loves a drink and a party after where I fucking hated that shit. So, mm. um, yeah, very much like Throne now. Like. And like, loads of things are through it. See the amount of energy that you're actually, you call it selfish, but the amount of, like, the amount of energy you're putting into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. like. There's only has to be a come down after that, you know, to build up the fucking, you know, whatever the camp, what is the camp, 12 weeks or whatever it is, I mean, you know, you're going in and it's helter skelter, your tunnel vision, boom, 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 and then it's nearly like an anti-climax after, after, it's like boom, then you're back to, like, strange in the yeah, diet, it's just yeah. it like, nearly like a drug in a way, isn't it, like, it's yeah. just nuts, but, and I find it fascinating that you haven't even had a spar since that, that night you, you left the ring, but, uh, was it then, sort of, was there a transition, tra Transition then from boxing into management. Did that happen sort of? Happened on the night. On the night. On the okay. night. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Sandra who had run into guys, she had said me because I would have been helping with Tyrone, mm. helping with other fighters while I'm in camp. I would have been speaking to people on their behalf. Mm. I would have had good relationship and connections around boxing, and kind of the first next step. Was so you were always that big brother figure. The the others, others, yeah, well. the others, yeah, okay. I would have kind of like said, just don't do that or do that or look at this guy. And yep. as I said, when I was in that mindset, everything is boxing. Like mm -hmm. now, it's the same, but just not as one track. You're spread over so many different, different people, branches. different branches, different different outlets to kind of look after. But at that stage, so I would have like looked at other fights for other people and said, like, don't do him or whatever, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So. It started off coming into like mentor younger fighters mm -hmm. coming through, speak to younger fighters, give them a bit of help, especially at the start of the career. My career went from down and up where you you were fighting for next to nothing, then you're good, earning good mm -hmm. money and all these different things. So I was able to kind of give a, a full landscape of what the the murky world of boxing looked like, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what it, it just started to develop, and then. Macklin was looking after Macklin, Michael in, in America. They were full year. I went with them. First year of Michael's career, Matthew Macklin was managing, and I just kind of shadowed everything he'd done, so understood his whole demographic. And towards the end of the, end of the year, Macklin had said um, he was going to go, he got a big job with Sky, and he was going to go back to England. And at that stage of Michael's career, he was fighting six fights, so every two months, six fights a year. New York, Chicago, Arizona, yeah. Brisbane. Look, it, it was just, it was mental. Like, it was just a, a roller coaster. And, and he had said, Will you, like, like, just watch who I speak to, understand why I speak to them, like, build up relations. And I didn't know any of these yeah. guys. They all knew Macklin because Macklin was fighting in, in America, so yeah. he had a bit of a reputation to all these Yanks. But I didn't know anyone, so I had to start from scratch. But that's kind of how it took off then on the Amic. Incredible, and then <clears throat> all I can think of now is like 10, 11, 12 year old Jimmy who, you know, the dad, your dad says like what we talked about near enough at the start, like, go there for a year 
I'll pay you 50 quid at the end of it, but I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. <laughs> and then you're in the box of management, like just stick it out, you don't know anything, you don't know what's going on. Half the time you're probably afraid, you're probably, what the fuck, I haven't a clue about this. But if you stick it out, you're going to reap your rewards. Mm -hmm. And probably all them things are, you know, that sort of resilience, them sort of people skills that I talked about, all them things that you probably learned at an early age, mm -hmm. getting into sports, uh, being where we're from, have now, now you're on like a global stage and there's Colin Boxing. Mm -hmm. Like, I suppose, for me and us, and like, I know the, the impact that you're making, uh, especially, like, we're both very passionate about Belfast mm -hmm. uh, and where we're coming from and what we want to do for other people, maybe on different levels, but it's the same. It's how we make people feel and how we can develop people mm -hmm. as people, not just boxers, like, and that's so, so important. But I, like, as I said at the Mick Loach times, whenever he was talking on our event and he was on the podcast and stuff like that, and even texted him a couple of times, like, thanking him for, you know, the, your help. And mm. I suppose you're the one behind it all. And I, mean, I only met you a few weeks ago yeah. over at the swim race. Like, so uh, it does mean a lot, like, for your support, your support, like, since I started this. Like, and I really, like, honestly, thanks very much. But I read out a message there from Mick. Um, like, obviously, Colin Boxing now is a, is a, you know, how many fighters do you have? We have eight. You have eight fighters. You know, you're making a real impact. You know, we're one with probably one of the biggest nights. Would you say ever coming soon? We have a big one. It's uh, a big week. A big with week. Canadian Dublin yeah. and medical and things. Yes. And, and you know it's massive, like, mm. and you can feel the buzz already coming around it in this class. But <clears throat> all I can think of now, I was driving down the road there, and Potty was on the podcast, mm -hmm. as you know, and like the difference in him, in yeah. like a period of time, not just you know as a boxer, or like oh, that's sort of see for everybody, but as a person too. Mm -hmm. You know the way he comes across. How uh, grounded he is, yeah. and how much like he nearly hasn't changed, and hasn't forgot where he's came from, and how he carries himself. Like it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm reading that all either. <laughs> so this is what Potty had to say. <clears throat> Jimmy is providing local boxers a worldwide platform through ESP and other major TV companies the chance to achieve their dreams. Personally, Jimmy Conlon has guided my own career this far. He not he not only cares about the boxing side, or the sorry the business side of boxing. He has his boxers' best interests at heart. I have achieved more than I could have ever imagined, and I owe Jamie the lot of that. Thanks very much, Jamie Connor. Mm -hmm. It's like a big red book. Is it Parkinson? Is the red book? Of it? This is your life. That's it. This is your life. <laughs> like. I should do it more often, I guess, in podcasts. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, so <laughs> there's something in that. Um, so that's the impact that you're now making on people. Like, you know, the, the what you've done at 21 years of age to make. Mm -hmm. Making that choice to be like, great, go ahead, and I'll have your back 100% of the way. You're now providing that platform for other boxers in our city, and I suppose you have Kurt Walker too, he's this part, isn't he? Yeah, he's this part. Um, how, 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 how does that even make you feel, and how, how, how are you finding it all? I, I don't kind of live in the moment kind of thing. I just focus on the end goal and then whatever. What is the end goal? Well, if, if the end goal is May 27, first yeah. and foremost, and that's kind of what has been my just drive for the past while now, since March of last year when Mick lost Lee Wood. Yeah. Right? Um, that hurt more than anything. Um, so you but, felt his pain like whenever? Oh, fuck, that killed me, man. Mm. I didn't think it would kill me as much as they kill me, but it killed me. It's the worst book. You know, I'm a control of controllables kind of mm -hmm. guy. Like if I'm in control, like even though if I'm not the best at doing it, if, as long as I'm a very a control freak mm -hmm. when it comes to that. So when I'm in control, I know I can hold it. If I'm not in control of something, it's like it's, it's roller coaster shit for me. Mm -hmm. I hate it, um, and that's that's what that felt like. And just you know, especially the ups and downs and the whole. How we went about it before it, and we made a lot of some mistakes and stuff. I had to learn, and you know, it, it was a big learning process. Like, and it took me a while to really sit down and piece it together about that this was meant to be for a, a little learning. Yeah, it's amazing that because ten seconds, like yeah. if even, and it's a whole different perspective. Whatever you're saying, that ah, it's, it's a, that's kind of that was the kicking. That was the big kick in the nuts about it. But then also the saving grace about it because. Yeah. You're so bad. They're so close to you know 
and it, it's very hard. It was very hard to kind of put into like to to really accept and like like a, a lot of things. I I I find myself clashing internally with boxing a lot. I see what boxing does, good and bad, and just there's times I go. Involved in this, it's a very tough sport. Mm. So, how is a business and how is a manager? Do you do you then overcome that because yeah. it's not about you? No. It, so, when a business said that, yeah, I have to put a completely head mm. on it, like, and that, that's Find that hard. I do. I, yeah. I do. You can it, It's probably do it to you because because I'm I know and feel what they're going through is a good thing, but also is a bad thing because I'm too close at times when. Other guys, but I would like it. I would only like it this way. I feel like mm. I'm, I'm with them. If if I don't feel like I'm with them, then it, 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 there's no need for it for mm. me. There's no meaning. To be personal. Ah, I, I I I truly believe that in this game in the sport, it really needs to be personal because it's as personal as can be. It's too many fighting. It can no be lonely. Like, yeah, it's just you and someone else mm. in the ring. So if if everyone around you isn't personally involved or personally attached and emotionally attached. Then they shouldn't be near you mm. because they're just draining you or they're getting something out of you or doing something for, the, their, for their own personal reasons. So I think you need to be, I think it needs to be. And I, I thought, like, like, if it was, like, at very starting when I said, well, if it, if it's obviously going to be personal because it's my it's my brother. I, just, I don't think it would be as personal when I was, but it has been. Like, mm. the quality, the rate has been phenomenal. Like, and, mm. you know, as you, you, you touched on it, like, how he has grown, how his race has come and, how much he has grew mm. as both a boxer but also as, as a human being, like as a man, like it's it's insane and how his confidence level has come mm. up with what he's doing mm. in the ring and very, very always was like like I've known him since he was a kid and always very humble. You know, he was never boastful, never you know, he always kinda knew what like he just kept himself to himself, kept stayed back in the shadows. But I think really now he's grew to confidence and has really seen the true potential within himself and like like that was personal when we went to Germany. That was so personal. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened in Germany was personal, and, and I always thought I don't think I'd have that with anyone else outside Michael. But then I've had it with everyone. Like Kurt was personal, and Akira Malloy is personal, and Tyrone is always personal because we train together. Mm -hmm. And small wee things like that, and then they, it just kind of has to be. If it's not, then I, I shouldn't be in it. And I would, I would be very open and saying that we we shouldn't work together if it isn't personal. But separating. That in business is, is is hard, but also it's it's like my none of them. I learned a lot to do that. Like, I mm. learned a lot from that, and yeah, and that helped. Tough though. Fuck. Uh, you can even feel it off, like, uh. you know. And we even mentioned there, but I only remember there a couple of weeks ago when we went to we were going for a dip. I'm over down there now, and I go, oh, "What do you do? Just switch off." And and say you didn't even think about it. You just went. I don't switch it off. Oh, you can't. Um, are you beginning to see that there has to be an element of maybe? Right, I need to take a bit of time for Jamie here, or is it just is it just right May twenty seventh, and this is just it? Like, well, so you think May twenty seventh? Then as soon as like we like we had a show in Galway last weekend, last yeah. or Two weekends April twenty first. Right. Everything was April twenty first okay. until April twenty until until. Till the day of April twenty first, because yeah. I knew everything was okay. Right, straight back onto this. It's always the, like you're always chasing the next goal, and there probably will come a time where I have to go. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like just, just stop. But I, I, I don't think I want to. You love it. Ah, uh, gives you energy. I, like I don't think yeah. I could. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't. I need that. I need that drive. And as yeah. we spoke about leaving the transition from boxing to something else after, if I didn't have the drive, then. Like, would I chase a high elsewhere? Would I would I hit drink? Would I like, mm -hmm. like it just this kinda keeps me focused, it keeps me on a, on, on the good path. Like mm -hmm. and within that I do feel days like where you go from you're just all is gone, yeah. all is gone and then you kinda perk your back up. But I've uh, as we spoke about earlier, like the, the cold water dipping, the yoga, yeah. all that kinda yes. helps me. Yes. All, all this kinda thing I think brings me like I bang the phone off. Yes. No one speaks to me for about an hour. So you have boundaries. Ah, hundred percent. And I started this, like at the very start because I deal with a lot of US. Right. I'd be working very late, and then I'd be up very early. Mm. And at the at 
at the start when I started doing this and was unable to kind of real piece everything together, I was answering emails in bed at like six in the morning mm-hmm. when my kids had just woke up. Okay. So now I don't like to respond to anyone to a certain time. Mm-hmm. I, and I cut off at night times and stuff. Small wee mm-hmm. things where you kind of... I've had that here too. Like, I yeah. know what you mean. I someone well, you're, you're in starting, the morning on the drink and you're going, Jesus, yeah. I'm going to save the world here. No, yes. you don't. <laughs> yeah. You don't. You have to have them boundaries at the top of it. It's, it's, so, I think everyone needs yeah. to in life. Like, but if you're like training, training should be training yeah. boundary. This should be work yeah. boundary. Everything else. I think you need to kind of have set aside different in, in your schedule like times that yeah. kind of cut off on one thing or another that's separation and that's uh, why I've invited you to Wellness Wednesdays <laughs> with, with Connor and Richie like and it's just it is it's, just, it's important like the way yeah. you, we now have that sort of every Wednesday morning we're like right that's what we're doing mm-hmm. clear schedule but it's like no matter what people can wait you know right. and just having that it's so see the difference to me there in the last two months three months probably by just having that mm-hmm. three thing to look forward to too and then all of a sudden you're having conversations like we're having now which we're probably never because we're so busy you never really take time to sit and go Jesus what does Mick actually really think of me or Potty or where am I really or what impact yeah. am I doing a good job you know yeah. I you are you're doing a great yeah. job because we're just sitting after being vulnerable with each other for an hour like, and all of a sudden that creates and I've created that with most of the guests on this podcast that sort of then instant connection where you can't be friends then because mm-hmm. there's a level of respect now like you're only after being vulnerable or sharing you know maybe about some of your weaknesses some things that you want to work on your career your life there's all of a sudden like i respect you a lot mm. because you're you know you're being open and honest and 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 that can only create you know a good a good environment to feel mm-hmm. good about yourself like but we mentioned our end goals and stuff and you said may 27th there's still um which is going to be a massive night uh for obviously belfast boxing what give me a wee rundown about that just before we finish off there's still a few tickets left isn't there i just need 650 637 okay. as of this morning um it'll be a full on sale right. it's it's exceptional league but from top to bottom i think it's the the, the who's who the cream, cream of the crop and of of irish boxing and mm-hmm. tour no, and they get catchy coming back to belfast and he's been highly regarded throughout his career as being the guy who can, who can maybe do things Frampton was always tipping him he was in his camp and Everyone has said, like I've known him since again, since he was younger, mm-hmm. and always seen that this guy is naturally so gifted. Now he gets a chance to prove it on his home stage and really do something at home and build something at home. Party, another mm-hmm. step in the right direction. We just missed out on a final nominator for the world title against uh, Yamaguchi Falcao, the Brazilian. He then took the world title fight against Dave Morales. So it just goes to show you how close Party is for mm-hmm. for a big opportunity and a big fight. And he's fighting um, Diego Ramirez from Argentina. A real tough potential banana skin for Potty, first kind of South Pod that he's fought in a way, really rugged, strong, um, good South American. Uh, Fergus Quinn from, from Belique in South Armagh. Mm-hmm. Uh, you bring us across my game boys up there. Again, like, the kind of people I like to work with is the like a Fergus, the like a Potty. Mm-hmm. These are just like blue colour, no nonsense. Decent human beings. Decent beings. human beings. No ego. Well, everyone has an mm. ego, but no real inflated ego, and just kind of get to work. Kurt, Kurt Walker and Kieran Malloy is our two big pros, prospects that we're building from the very start with top rank, and, and again another stage of their career where we're constantly trying to keep them. It's moving. Young kid from West Belfast, Connor Quinn, is going to have his he's first title podcast, fight. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. He's going to have a title fight. I'm just waiting on confirmation yeah. coming through against a one of Paddy Barnes' old old, old enemy, um, Juan. Arizona um, from Peru, tough enough in their first proper test for Connor, I, I, mm-hmm. I believe. And then Pierce Shaleri, kid from Dublin, he's like exceptional, real good driven, mm-hmm. really, really nice to speak to. Like he is, he could do something in Dublin, really something big, and he's fighting for a title as well. So it's going to be busy. Awesome. It's one of the end dates where, where you're going to kind of be entertained from start to finish. And the problem that we have is got so much talent on where it's going to be. Who's first and who's ah, the, the format? Ah, the format on it's really tough. It's mainly up to BT Sport, and you know that was a big live on BT, live on BT, yeah. live on ESPN, and it, like it's that's been the hardest part of doing all this yeah. is being the man in the middle of making sure these two big juggernauts come together and everyone works together and ESPN, BT, and timing and egos and uh, managing egos. Money, is, uh, money uh, egos is, uh, managing egos is my main problem. problem. My main job. Uh, the popularity contest nearly. Or? No, not necessarily. No, no just. Everyone is the big swinging dick well, in the room, aren't they? Uh, so, 
So I bet it's a big room and everyone yeah. has big decks. <laughs> so there's room for everyone. So we're everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Start a different conversation. <laughs> He's in the middle. <laughs> oh, Jimmy. <laughs> very good. <laughs> no, listen, thanks very much. I really, really enjoyed that. It was nice brilliant. Job. A really, really good chat. I, I'm, I, I'm annoyed I didn't get to ask you more Sorry. questions. Like, I wanted no. to ask you questions. Like, no, you're kind of... you, you touched on at the start about being like four years where you came from in the four yeah. years. Aye. And I struggle to think how can someone with how do you think be in that position four years ago? Like how is how is the Donald Nugent of what I'm looking at now, how is he how was he in that position? Aye. I was talking this morning, Jimmy, and I think that like I, like obviously where I was was a result of maybe my childhood and what mm -hmm. happened in terms of like trauma and different things um, and I used hurling football always gave me that escape yeah. up until I got to the age 18, 19 where as you said there drugs are so accessible out there like it's easier to get a bag of cocaine than what it is to get a bag of cigarettes like Chennai you know it's so like but ultimately I made choices I went down routes that you know I was a, probably a, a big role model to a lot of people at 18 mm -hmm. like and, and, Definitely in terms of hurting the football, like, but the making them choices then ultimately led me to a different escape that drugs gave me that hurting the football didn't. Mm. And you know, I was doing quite well as a were in England, doing or getting a few quid and stuff, and just spending on drinking drugs and not being honest to people. And I think it all, and that's why I have this podcast now, is, and, and it's all honest chats. Mm -hmm. You know, it's creating that honesty and creating that space for people to come on and say, do you know what? You know, you're half Colin Box and you're doing quite well, like Lex and Mick as well, you know, Potty, different people, Potty McDonald, like we've had people from all walks of life that come on to here and we have a perception that their lives are amazing. But underneath it, you know, we've all had our shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um but in terms of to put in the context, I guess ten, four years ago I was dead in that only. You know what I mean? Getting ready, I suppose, to go to rehab and 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 it was tough. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely tough and, and, and but now it's my sole purpose and the whole purpose in life to be, but like, I can relate a lot to what you're doing, maybe mm -hmm. being a big brother to people, I want to show people. Not just tell people, do you know what I mean? It's very easy to stand up and tell people, but show people that you can have a better quality life through action. Action to be more and more. Do you know, and this is the action by meeting you and creating a platform where we can be like, do you know what? I actually read it, there's a, there was a quote there, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And it's the people who we surround ourselves with, and, and, and that's what's helped me a lot. Like, but, it's interesting, but it's class, and, and I see it as the journey with no destination. Do you know what I mean? I'm always learning, I'm always trying to grow and evolve and have these conversations and, and always sort of checking in on myself. Mm -hmm. and I think that's so important too. Like, but yeah, it's interesting okay. stuff. And it's, um, but it's not about me anymore. It's about the next person who messages maybe, let's face it, and asks for help. Mm -hmm. like, how can we help them? Do you know what I mean? How can they go on their journey? If, and I always have this thing, and you see it there about my. Uh, and maybe self-reflection on about be excited about who you want to become. So it's the next person who walks through this door, the next person who asks for help. That's that's be excited about who you want to become. Like, and that's my mm -hmm. whole purpose in life. But I, we're not interesting. <laughs> but no, yeah. Thanks we're very not. much. Great chat. And here again, a huge thanks to Hughes Cars and I and Anthony and Stephen and all the team for your continued support. It's greatly appreciated. So uh, www.usecarsni.com for all your car needs. If anyone, I suppose, was triggered. Um, with what me and Jamie spoke about, maybe even there towards the end as well. Uh, please do drop us a message and we'll point you in the direction of, of getting some help. And there is still a few tickets left for um, May the 27th in the Odyssey. Honestly, I would recommend to jump on it just to see um, even the work that the Jamie does, but and then just to see a wee bit of history in, in Belfast and seeing Mick Hanlon becoming world champion. Like, you know, he said it. On the podcast nearly a year ago, that it was always his, his burning desire and deep inside him to become world champion, like, and we just can't wait to see it. So, no, huge thanks, and uh, thanks you to all for listening and for the continued support, and I'll see you all next week. Cheers.